Many years ago, exchanging of important information was done to promote peace, benefit and negotiations. And ever since then, this task was given a significant name and value, terming it as diplomacy, which currently the world depends on, to strike a balance and to work hand in hand for the growth of economic, political and cultural affairs of each country. And today, to speak about the importance of diplomacy in world affairs, we are pleased to have His Excellency Michael Edward Appleton, the New Zealand High Commissioner for Sri Lanka. Your Excellency, we are indeed honoured to have you with us today and uh, congratulations on becoming the first High Commissioner uh, to Sri Lanka from New Zealand. Um, so how, where and how did it all start of you wanting to becoming a diplomat? Well, first, thanks very much for the invitation. It's so um, uh, kind of you to invite me on, and I'm really uh, uh, looking forward to the interview. Um, but to answer that question, I think there are a few things. One is I'm a very uh, patriotic person. I was, since I was a little child, I am fiercely proud of New Zealand. Um, uh, I want my country to do well. Um, and uh, so that's an important part of it. I think the other part, another part was that it was my parents' example. They were they devoted their lives to public service so my, my mother was a nurse and a midwife uh, my father uh, worked in the public sector to reduce uh, road deaths in New Zealand so I think their example of public service was a, uh, was important to me and then I think the third thing was uh, as a young man growing up in this small isolated country New Zealand I was um, really passionate about getting out into the world and trying to understand it um, and how it differed from New Zealand. And I guess all of these three things mixed up in very early, I think even when I was in high school, I was interested in diplomacy. as one possible option, maybe alongside uh, some others, including journalism was another one I considered. My, uh, my parents were much more keen on the, uh, the diplomacy thing than the journalism thing. I'm not sure, uh, sure why, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, uh, it, it worked out and I did become a diplomat. Yeah. And uh, I guess you started, like you said, in 2005, so it's yeah. almost 16 to 17 years. Long time, yeah. So, uh, what You're sort me of feel challenges? <laughs> <laughs> so, what sort of challenges have you uh, come across? Well, I mean, I think um, in that period, no doubt, the biggest um, challenge that New Zealand diplomacy has faced, and probably the world has faced, has been COVID-19 in the last few years. Okay. And I was working for our foreign minister at, at the time that um, COVID uh, emerged as this challenge and you know as a small uh, island country uh, which thrives off its connections to the world it was a really scary time to see the world closing down and you know the flows of people which are the lifeblood of of uh, New Zealand's economy uh, closing down so I think that's probably uh, in my diplomatic career the biggest event and the biggest uh, the most memorable um, uh, event and series of actions that uh, my government um, and all governments had to take um, I suppose on the on the sort of the challenging side that per, the person one of the most personally challenging things I've had to do as a New Zealand diplomat was I was um, my last posting was in India and I happened to be in Bangladesh uh, in April of um, of twenty uh, of April twenty fourteen and um, there was sorry April twenty fifteen and there was um, a significant earthquake and when I was in uh, Dhaka, I thought it was such a significant earthquake that the earthquake must be in Bangladesh, but in fact the earthquake was in Nepal and so I was sent to Nepal soon after uh, the earthquake happened and the task for New Zealand for the New Zealand team there was to try to track down the hundreds of New Zealanders who were there and unaccounted for and the reason that was a really difficult situation was that the, that the main people we were dealing with understandably were the family members of New Zealanders who were missing and you know that must be one of the hardest situations you can be in as a uh, as a human being not knowing where your family member is this sort of devastating uh, event having taken place and sort of walking around this devastated uh, city Kathmandu uh, was just a really um, challenging situation it was a harrowing situation for uh, uh, Nepal to go through um, and they lost many 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 of their own people um, so I think you know anyway those are two sort of contrasting examples but um, I guess as a diplomat when you're you know living overseas um, if something um, if, if a big event happens and it, especially if it affects directly your country citizens then um, it becomes an event that you need to respond to and uh, any memorable uh, incidents that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> Memorable <laughs> incidents. No, I mean, I think that the, many of the, 
many of the things I think I'll remember when I'm an old person um, sort of probably relate to historical events that you're present for. So I was in, um, I was in um, uh, the United States when uh, President Obama was re-elected. I was in India when uh, Narendra Modi was elected as Prime Minister for the first time. I was here when, um, in 2015 when there was the change from uh, um, uh, President Rajapaksa to President Sivasena. And, you know, these are historical events and just uh, witnessing how um, the people of that country respond to those historical events is just a really interesting thing. And I suppose the last thing I'd say about those memorable events, my very first posting was to East Timor, um, small country um, to the north of Australia. And at the time, New Zealand had uh, both police and military present because there had been unrest there. And I remember as a young diplomat, you know, sort of I was, I guess I was 23 at the time, seeing people who, New Zealanders who are my age um, uh, or younger uh, as police and as, um, and as military personnel, you know, putting themselves at risk um, to try to uphold peace in another, in another country was really uh, humbling about the sacrifices that, um, uh, that some people make. I guess all the um, memorable incidents and uh, challenges molds us to become uh, more experienced, uh, more stronger people in um, the way we can handle worse situations. Uh, so with that, you mentioned that you were in India. So you've been having close connections with South Asia for a very, very long time. Uh, how do you think that the South Asian region is um, geopolitically important to uh, New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, I think um, South Asia um, has definitely become much, much more important uh, economically, culturally, socially, um, and geostrategically uh, to the world. Um, and New Zealand is no, uh, no different to that. Um, the fact that we've opened this post in Colombo, uh, only our second high commission in South Asia, um, is a reflection of the fact that the New Zealand government thinks that South Asia has um, become more significant and that New Zealand needs more uh, investment uh, in this part of the world. Um, uh, you know the two billion people here, um, and all of the things that flow, uh, all the things that flow from that. Um, and I think that um, one of our jobs is the um, is this new uh, New Zealand High Commission in South Asia and in Colombo is to really help um, reflect South Asia's importance in the world back into the New Zealand, um, back into New Zealand, uh, so that. I mean, there are a large number of New Zealanders who are aware of that, including the very large number of New Zealanders of South Asian descent. Uh, but I think when New Zealanders think of Asia in a um, in a geostrategic um, uh, point of view, they mostly think of North Asia. They mostly think of China um, and of Japan, I guess. Um, and so I think the emergence of South Asia is, um, you know, this very vibrant and uh, important uh, uh, partner geostrategically. Um, uh, is now something that New Zealand is grasping hold of. So speaking of um, cultural affairs, yeah. um, that is also very important, I guess, yeah. because as uh, human beings, we, we can say we're all human beings. At the end of the day, uh, geographically and uh, culturally, we do have our differences and we need to learn to respect and value someone else's difference mm. and their way of life. Yeah. Um, so speaking of that, um, the Hakka performance, uh, I mean, it's quite famous here in Sri Lanka mm. and the Sri Lankans love it. Mm. What is your, uh, how do you feel about uh, the Hakka performance that comes from your country? Well, the haka itself, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, is most famous um, uh, globally uh, because uh, the All Blacks, um, probably New Zealand's most well-known sporting team, uh, uh, they they perform it before every match, and um, so I guess you know, as somebody who's watched the All Blacks play probably uh, since I was a toddler, before I can even remember, um, it's sort of. Um, it's just a very, uh, it's an integral part of my sense of national identity and what it means to be a New Zealander that this, um, uh, that this ritual take place when um, our most successful uh, and, um, uh, and most well-known sporting team uh, competes. You know, they are a very important part of how New Zealand's identity is formed uh, internationally. Um, so I'm very proud of the, the haka and, I'm, um, and I love it that um, it's so popular internationally and I love that the All Blacks are so popular in, um, in Sri Lanka. It was something that surprised me when I first came here um, in 20, uh, 2014 and um, the fact that so many Sri Lankans uh, you know, come up to me and want to, talk, want to talk to me about rugby <laughs> is, um, 
um, is I think a great reflection of um, you know the power of sport uh, to connect people and uh, the power of the of the All Blacks as a sort of international phenomenon. Um, but there are you know lots of ways in which. New Zealand and Sri Lanka are very culturally connected. I mean, to take it to you know from a com commercial point of view, um, the thing that Sri Lanka exports to New Zealand more than anything else is Dilma tea, and the Dilma tea brand is so well known in New Zealand because Meryl Fernando has been on our TV screens for decades and decades, and he is a trusted uh, person, and his um, his tea, um, his family's tea. Is, um, is one of the most popular teas in, in New Zealand. And the reverse of that is if you, you all know, travelling around Sri Lanka, driving around this um, a great big diverse island, that um, the brand name Anchor <laughs> is everywhere uh, because um, so many Sri Lankans trust uh, this, these dairy products that have been sent to New Zealand from Sri Lanka for a very long time. And you know, food is a very... Um, Food is a very uh, personal and very sacred thing for every culture, and the fact that we that we uh, have shared these uh, <laughs> these food products, I think, is a very important cultural exchange that we've had for many decades. But there are many ways. So you mentioned that you mentioned the Haka and the All Blacks. Sport is a very important way in which we are culturally connected. The fact that we have so many now Sri Lankan uh, New Zealanders of Sri Lankan descent is a huge uh, is a huge asset. To these cultural connections, it's uh, it's it's rare that a day passes without me meeting or somebody contacting me who is a New Zealand of Sri Lankan descent who wants to make uh, the most of these cultural connections, these people to people connections that we have. So there's a lot that the New Zealand High Commission can do in the space of culture, in the space of sport, and the space of food, um, and we will definitely be trying to make the most of those as we build the relationship. And uh, what is your view on uh, cricket? What's my view on cricket? <laughs> well, I'm a, I have been since, I think since my father first took me to a cricket test match when I was seven, I think, in Wellington, my hometown, I've been obsessed about the, <laughs> the sport of cricket. Um, I think New Zealand as a whole is a sports-obsessed nation. Uh, most of sport uh, obsessed with rugby, but obsessed with a whole lot of sports, including cricket. I My particular obsession is cricket, and so living in a culture like the Sri Lankan culture, which is saturated <laughs> with cricket, um, is delightful. Um, being able to turn on the TV at any time and there being highlights of some old cricket game um, is very uh, comforting <laughs> for me. But it's also a connection, I feel, you know, that I have or um, New Zealanders have with, um, with ordinary Sri Lankans because, you know, um, other than the Hakka and the All Blacks, the thing that um, uh, Sri Lankans who are not government people or diplomats or whatever uh, want to talk to me about are cricket, uh, rugby, sometimes <laughs> dairy products. Um, these are the things that, that New Zealand is well known for and um, you know we have to make the most of these connections. Actually yesterday I was at the home of Arjuna Ranatunga, um, Sri Lanka's Cricket World Cup winning captain and um, he was talking very fondly of his connections to New Zealand cricketers. So the, there is a family of sports people um, uh, and I think they can be a great asset for um, our uh, bilateral connections. And Your Excellency, yes, um, New Zealand and Sri Lanka has been connected for a very long time. Uh, but then it was in 2021 that we established our High Commission yep. first here in Sri Lanka. So yep. it's like a very short span of time. So what sort of decisions have you taken that could benefit uh, each other's countries in this short span of time? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say, just to pick up what you said about the history, is that um, uh, we in New Zealand are really proud of our long um, friendship with Sri Lanka. From uh, from independence onwards, we were, um, you know, founding um, members of the Colombo Plan, um, which delivered to um, a generation of Sri Lankans uh, educational opportunities, whether scholarships to um, to New Zealand or training uh, here in Sri Lanka. And um, our Prime Minister, um, Walter Nash, came here in the late 1950s as an expression of, um, of that friendship. And then the, uh, the significant dairy trade happened uh, from then onwards as well. So there have been these strong connections for a long time. And I think our governments, you know, Sri Lanka and New Zealand, jointly decided that we were going to open uh, high commissions in each, each other's countries um, uh, under the previous government in both countries, both in both Sri Lanka and uh, in New Zealand, um, at the time that your then Prime Minister, Mr Wickramasinghe, was in New Zealand, that's when the announcement was made. And um, 
this was a recognition from both countries is that we're we're too close and have too much going on and too much potential to not try and invest in the relationship and make more uh, of it. In terms of the specific things, you know, right now that we're trying to do to build on the relationship, there are a lot of things. I mean, one of one of our big priorities on the economic side is to try and build and diversify the trade and economic relationship. So there have been, as I've mentioned, these um, long-standing, whether it's tea or it's milk powder, there are these long-standing uh, trade items. But, you know, Sri Lanka and New Zealand make a very broad range of products that we think uh, we should be trading with one another. And so tr trying, to, trying to build those um, is an important uh, component of our work. Another work is sort of in the security space that we, Sri Lanka and New Zealand, share a range of security challenges, whether they be terrorism, whether they be people smuggling, um, whether they be drug smuggling, and we feel that if our security agencies are better able to, um, or are, um, are cooperating more, then uh, we will be able to tackle those challenges uh, uh, better. So there are, and we've already talked about the people, um, are people to people and sporting connections, certainly a big, um, as, a, as a sports mad high commissioner, certainly uh, one of my um, objectives is to try to you know, um, make some initiatives happen in that area as well. And Your Excellency, uh, you spoke of the dairy yeah. production. So yeah. uh, New Zealand is like the eighth largest country that uh, produces dairy products and uh, uh, they almost um, export to 130 countries. Yeah. So uh, comparatively, Sri Lanka does the same, but uh, we don't have a large capacity. Mm. So how can New Zealand help us uh, develop that uh, industry? Yeah, I mean, we're really, New Zealand's really committed to helping Sri Lanka build uh, the capacity, the productivity, the efficiency um, of its dairy, uh, its dairy sector. Um, we share the Sri Lankan government's desire uh, that uh, much more um, dairy products are produced um, in Sri Lanka and for the past we signed a dairy cooperation arrangement with the Sri Lankan government in 2013 so I guess nine years ago now and we've invested over a billion dollars uh, sorry a billion rupees um, in uh, dairy activities since then which have been aimed in helping uh, the Sri Lankan dairy industry to uh, to, to build. Some of them, that has been about veterinary uh, education, some of it has been about uh, about dairy training, some of it's been he helping smallholder farmers in dry zones in the north um, to be more productive. Um, all of that is aimed at trying to increase um, the milk yield um, of, uh, of Sri Lanka. Um, and you might say, well why does, why does New Zealand, a country that exports dairy products, uh, wish to help another country uh, do the same. Partly that is that our, um, um, our dairy companies, um, they know that New Zealand is a small country <laughs> and we have probably, that we are probably already producing as much dairy um, as we are going to produce. And so the way that they can you know, build, their, uh, build their businesses is to go into other countries and to form partnerships and to help other countries build their dairy production. And so I think you know, in an ideal world, and, and if, you, if you were interviewing um, uh, the New Zealand High Commissioner in 10 years' time, uh, that, uh, that person would be talking about a situation where we um, had helped uh, in Sri Lanka's efforts to build its dairy production, to, to help um, uh, you know, feed uh, Sri Lankan consumers, but also help them to export um, Sri Lankan dairy products to you know the wider the wider region. Um, there's no particular reason why that couldn't happen, um, and you know all of our efforts, whether it's our government efforts or it's the efforts of New Zealand dairy companies who operate here um, and who have invested a lot in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, th th that's what those efforts are for. And I suppose the last thing I'd say about New Zealand dairy companies is that. Um, they now, as they operate in Sri Lanka, are turning themselves into essentially Sri Lankan businesses here. They, um, Fonterra, our largest uh, dairy com uh, company, collects milk from thousands of Sri Lankan farmers uh, every day uh, to sell products um, in Sri Lankan supermarkets. So many of the anchor products that Sri Lankans are buying are actually Sri Lankan milk, not, uh, not uh, products brought from New Zealand. And I think that's a sort of model that we can expect to grow. And uh, we find a lot of Sri Lankans wanting to study in New Zealand. Mm. Uh, so if we speak of the education sector, uh, what other developments can we do and uh, strengthen this tie of them mm. travelling to uh, New Zealand and studying and uh, educating themselves? Well, the first thing I should say is that um, Sri Lankans coming to New Zealand and studying 
um, is something that the New Zealand uh, government in, uh, loves and that has greatly enriched New Zealand society over a long period of time. So, you know, since since independence, since the Colombo Plan, there have been Sri Lankans uh, doing that. And, you know, some of those Sri Lankans decide to stay and settle in New Zealand and the Sri Lankan community in New Zealand is very much built on these people, these uh, students who go to study in New Zealand. And uh, there is no profession in New Zealand that doesn't have prominent uh, Sri Lankan New Zealanders in it, whether it be doctors or uh, engineers or social workers or journalists, whatever you want to name, lawyers, um, there are prominent Sri Lankan um, uh, New Zealanders in them and they have contributed greatly to New Zealand society, which is a way of explaining why we are so keen to uh, continue but build the number of Sri Lankans coming to New Zealand uh, as students. Um, uh, both for the New Zealand benefit, but also many of them obviously will come back and uh, contribute to Sri Lankan society as well. COVID has made things tricky for the last couple of years because um, uh, uh, New Zealand uh, hasn't been open to non-New Zealanders um, for that period of time. And so um, universities uh, in New Zealand working with Sri Lankan partners have, have had to come up with uh, novel ways of working around that. One particular way is for students to start their study in Sri Lanka and then after a year or two transfer across to New Zealand. So there are a lot of 1 plus 3 or 2 plus 2 programs that have been built um, to help with that. Um, and so uh, that's one thing. And I think the other thing um, that's important for our High Commission to do at least is to sort of promote New Zealand as an education destination. I mean it's clear from the numbers prior to COVID that uh, there are a number of countries uh, that Sri Lankans think of first before New Zealand when it comes to um, an education um, destination. So um, I think we just need to you know, make greater efforts to promote uh, understanding of New Zealand as a possible place to come. And uh, speaking of COVID, um, yeah. yes, it's been almost two and a half years mm. that we've been going through this yeah. and uh, it has crippled the world economy. Yeah. But then New Zealand managed to strategically mitigate it. How did you all manage to do that? Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is like COVID is a very, um, very tricky and cunning adversary. <laughs> it keeps, you know, mutating. Uh, it keeps uh, tricking us, and um, and so nobody. I, I say that to say that no, no government has had it easy. Um, New Zealand, you know, has been through phases in the in the um, it, certainly for the first year, year and a half. Uh, um, the basic premise of the New Zealand approach was that we have a very, we've got a vulnerable population um, and we don't want large numbers of them heading to hospital and then dying because of this disease. And the only way, this virus, and the only way that we can stop that is to prevent the disease as much as possible from coming into New Zealand. So there were some key components to how we did that. Uh, in, in the initial outbreaks we had very stringent lockdowns but those were successful, uh, they didn't last that long, they, they last a matter of let's say six weeks, they were successful at stamping out the virus in New Zealand. Um, and then we had very stringent border controls, so from, uh, it's, it's exactly two years ago, March of, uh, uh, of, 20, um, of 2020, we closed our border. And that was a very um, historic and difficult decision <laughs> for the New Zealand government to take because we are, uh, we pride ourselves on being a country that is open to the world and which benefits hugely from the world coming to New Zealand. So that was a massive decision. But our border closure to non-New Zealanders um, was, you know, a core part of keeping um, keeping the virus out. And then the next, and then the third part uh, was a quarantine system. So a, com a compu compulsory quarantine system on arrival, 14 days. Um, and that system was effective. So those three things that I mentioned um, were effective at keeping um, COVID out to a large extent. We had, we had long periods, months and months and months, with no COVID, zero COVID in the community in New Zealand. Um, and the initial lockdowns that we had to experience in March and April of 2020 um, were the only lockdowns for a long period of time. Um, things, have, things changed, obviously, when the vaccination um, came in and uh, I think the New Zealand government was determined that we vaccinate everybody um, uh, or as much as, as, as possible, get our vaccination rates as high as possible so that when there are significant outbreaks in the community as there inevitably would have to be if you open up, um, 
that there aren't you know very high numbers of of deaths and so that's what we're going through at the moment in fact we have um, we have uh, got rid of the uh, quarantine system at the border uh, we have very high vaccination rates in the high 90 percent um, and as a result although we have very large case numbers at the moment uh, so far uh, the death numbers have been relatively low you know relative to like countries around the world so that's sort of um, that's sort of been in a nutshell the approach but it's been difficult for New Zealand like it's been for every country I know um, uh, from uh, my family um, and from my friends that people after two years of this thing <laughs> this is true in every country I'm sure are so fed up with it so tired so um, irritated by the daily inconveniences of this thing and want it to be over that's human nature and so I think the challenge for every government is to uh, get us from where we are now to a situation where people feel like uh, they have their lives back but we can't control what COVID-19 is and what it does um, and uh, we will always, I think the New Zealand government will always uh, be looking to minimise uh, any deaths from the virus so that's, the, um, that's always the trade-off. So uh, Sri Lanka and New Zealand, um, we both come under the Commonwealth yeah. and um, what can we do to strengthen our bilateral ties under the Commonwealth banner? Well, the first thing I'd say is about uh, the Commonwealth 2022 is a special year because uh, the Queen is, uh, is celebrating or commemorating uh, 70 years since um, sh uh, her um, accession to the throne. And, um, you know, I think the, the foundation, um, uh, uh, her, at the, um, her at the head of the Commonwealth in the sense of, you know, providing uh, that figurehead and her, her decades of service are, are something that um, you know worth remembering um, are worth remembering this year. In terms of your question about um, cooperation, I think that um, uh, we have the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting happening in Rwanda later this year, and I think there, there's been a gap of about four years because of COVID since the last uh, the last meeting. But sort of some of the issues that um, sort of are really important to New Zealand that I think. Uh, do provide a basis for cooperation um, include climate change. I mean, many, many members of the Commonwealth, including in the Pacific, but also in, in the Indian Ocean, are small island developing states who are um, uh, unusually or disproportionately vulnerable uh, to climate change. Um, uh, so that's one. I think oceans management is another. You know, just like with small island developing states, uh, climate change challenge, the, the challenge of ensuring that these uh, small countries, which have very um, small economic bases are actually getting the economic benefit from their ocean resources while uh, while protecting those ocean resources is a really important challenge that uh, New Zealand and uh, Sri Lanka could be working on. And then I think there's sort of a values um, a piece here which is, is that the Commonwealth is founded on the idea that you can only be in the Commonwealth if you are a democracy, if you practice good governance, you believe in the rule of law, um, free media, that's why the Commonwealth sends election observers all around, uh, all around the Commonwealth. And I think this is another, found, this is another area that New Zealand um, uh, and Sri Lanka can work on because there are institutions that we uh, both have. One example is our ombudsman. Uh, we, uh, we could learn from each other and uh, provide assistance to each other. Yeah. And um, since you've been a student who studied international relations, um, what sort of advice can you give to students who pursue to uh, become um, diplomats or <laughs> want to uh, study international relations? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, I'd say about the New Zealand Foreign Service that um, I'm quite unusual in having studied international relations. Most New Zealand diplomats uh, have studied other things. Um, so it's not, it's not necessary, well certainly it's not in our system, to have studied international relations in an academic sense before becoming a diplomat. I mean what I would say about diplomacy mostly is that it's mostly about people. It's about um, connecting with people uh, from different cultures and having them understand your perspective, having them feel that you understand their perspective uh, and trying to convince them to do something you might want them to do or think about the thing, the demand that they make of you. Um, and that really is mostly about um, uh, cultural competency and empathy more than it is about um, you know having learnt about 
you know, this war in the 1700s or, you know, that uh, international diplomatic dispute um, uh, in the, you know, ancient times. Um, so my advice really is to, um, is that you ought to study things that you are passionate about and that give you an opportunity, um, you know, maybe through extracurricular activities too, to find ways that you're able to be interacting with people from uh, a range of different cultures. I mean, I was lucky in that my master's class, so the class um, uh, doing my master's when I was in the UK, was made up of students from all around the world. So I think we were a class of, let's say, 25 people, and even though we were in the UK, there were only two British people in the class, everybody else was from around the world. And that was a very good um, uh, case study for me, or introduction to me, of what diplomacy is like. That is to say, you spend most of your time talking to people who have very different cultural uh, backgrounds to you, very different perspectives, and if you can't connect with them, then you're not going to be a successful uh, diplomat. So I'm not sure if that's advice, but uh, <laughs> those so. are some reflections. <laughs> no, I guess that's like a very important and a very valuable advice, because at the end of the day, what the world understands is humanity. I mean, yeah. that's what we want. We see so much happening in the world uh, at present. So I think uh, from... We've been at an era where there was war and then we've come back to civilization and I guess again we see it happening around so mm -hmm. uh, what we can spread is peace and what we can spread is humanity so your advice is uh, quite valuable um, Your Excellency and uh, uh, thank you for all the support and cooperation that you have given Sri Lanka uh, you and your government so we are um, very very um, honored of your presence and all what you're doing for Sri Lanka and we take this opportunity to uh, wish you and your family all the very best in life. Thanks very much and you too. So thank you so much for joining us today.